By the way, did you find the recordings useful? Did, did you why, look at it? Or <laughs> okay, so what I want to do today is to finish the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. <coughs> tell you uh, and also give you some application of hopefully we, we can get to that oh by the way I officially scratched the distinction between homework and projects because I wanted to I saw the reflected on the website too let's take a look at it so that's this is our website right so now this says just project and homework 65 percent so there is no no separate categories for 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 them so I think we will end up doing more projects that said the uh, the assignment I am planning to release tomorrow will we'll probably be more on the homework side would be like more like a, similar to midterm like do some uh, exercises on the paper because it takes a little bit to build up like enough theory so we can actually start doing some interesting applications so maybe we can instead just practice your determinant and eigenvalue eigenvector computation skills okay let me make this bigger all right, so we started talking about what are eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So let me recap that briefly. And then we'll jump into what you need to do if they don't exist and you need to go, go to complex domain. I think that's what I ended with the last time, right? So let's, but let's start from the beginning. So eigenvalue, eigenvector, that's for a square matrix. And the input matrix is always going to be a real, even though, some, even though today we will see we'll need to uh, consider complex eigenvalues and complex eigenvectors. And always remember, please, that the eigenvectors must be non-zero uh, non vectors, must be non-trivial vectors. We, we discussed that uh, last time, right? And the eigenvalue eigenvector, they are defined like this, AB equals uh, d uh, lambda V, when lambda is the eigenvalue and V is the eigenvector, as long as V is not zero, okay? Why don't I want the zeros there? Does, does somebody want to recap that? <laughs> Because zero vector would be trivially satisfying that, right? That, but why, why do I make the fuss about it? <laughs> the point of eigenvectors is actually not that it's a vector, but that it's a direction, right? What really matters is the subspace it generates, okay? Not, not so much the vector itself, because as we have seen, the vectors are uh, define up to scaling, right? You can scale it by a non-zero scalar and you still get an absolutely valid eigenvector with exactly the same eigenvalue. But in only one case, this would not define a one-dimensional subspace, right? In the case that the vector is zero, because if you multiply zero vector with whatever, you just keep getting zero vectors back, right? So that, that's why we need to not allow, allow that case. Okay, and last time we worked out how to find eigenvalues. So there is this, this nice, uh, you just rewrite it first, then, and then you take the determinant. The determinant detects that the matrix is singular. This way you uh, take the V out of the equation and you can write down the formula just for eigenvalues. This formula is a polynomial of degree n, where n is the, uh, the size of our matrix, the square matrix again. And this polynomial is called the characteristic polynomial of that given matrix. And if we find the roots of the characteristic polynomial, then these roots will be the eigenvalues, okay? I'm going through it quickly because we already had it last time. I just wanna put the next stuff in context. I did this, this example the last time. So we computed eigenvalues and eigenvectors for a two by two matrix, which looks like this. So we first wrote the determinant, the characteristic polynomial. So this, this is the characteristic polynomial. So the roots of the characteristic polynomial are the eigenvalues, okay? Here we computed them. So for this matrix, the roots of the characteristic polynomial and the eigenvalues are one and 0.5. And once we have the eigenvalues, it's a relatively easy matter to get the eigenvectors, right? Because you already know what the lambdas are. So you would take one of the lambdas or you take each lambda in a turn and you compute the corresponding eigenvector, okay? So you pick one lambda, here, here I picked first one, was, there was one and 0.5, there were the two eigenvalues, so here I put there one, and I need to find some vector which is in the null space of this matrix. Again, the same idea, zero would be a not interesting solution, right? And the vector in the null space, again, what matters there is the one dimensional subspace. Okay, not what particular vector in the subspace I choose to represent the subspace, okay? And we did the analysis also for, or we did the same thing, we repeated the same thing for the second eigenvalue for the 0.5 eigenvalue, does this work? And we got an eigenvector V2 
which was, I think it was minus one, one, right? Or I could just put there one minus one, right? Doesn't matter because there's just a scalar multiplication away from it, okay? Let me try to focus it a little bit better. All right, so maybe uh, let's um, look at the geometric interpretation in this particular example, okay? So we have this particular matrix. So let's take a look, what is the geometric interpretation of the eigenvalues in, in, this, in this particular case? So we know that, let me write it here, so one of the eigenvectors was one, right? And the corresponding eigenvalue was, I can, Sorry, eigenvalue was one, and the corresponding eigenvector was how much was it? Uh, I can write like, for example, one point five and one, right? To to like write it nicely, one point five and one, and the other one was uh, zero point five, and the corresponding eigenvector was one and minus one. Okay, so we can look at it uh, geometrically. What does it mean? for the matrix A. So every matrix A I can see as a, as a transformation on vectors from 2D, right? If I take an arbitrary vector from 2D, then AX, because A is a two by two matrix in this case, is again 2D vector, right? So I take some vector and the matrix maps it somewhere else, okay? And the point of the eigenvectors is that those are the special, special vectors which get mapped onto themselves up to a scale by the matrix, okay? So the V1, so if I my one is here, this is one, so here 1.5 would be about here. So my V1 vector is here. And this vector has the special property that the matrix A maps it onto itself. You see? What happens with V2? V2 is one and minus one, right? So there would be my minus one. This would be my V2 vector. And what the matrix does on in the direction V2, so if I feed the matrix V2, meaning I do this, A, V2, what do I get? What does the matrix do in that direction? So geometric interpretation of eigenvectors. Yep. Scales it by half, right? So V2 gets mapped onto like half its size. So from this picture, you can also see why it doesn't really matter which vector I pick there, right? Like for example, if I picked vector two and minus two, again, the matrix would just scale it by half in that direction. So that's what matters, the direction and what the matrix does in that direction, okay? That's, that's really the point. And you can also clearly see that if the matrix happened to be a rotation in 2D, uh, non-trivial rotation, rotation with a non-zero <coughs> angle, then clearly I, I cannot possibly have any eigenvector, right? Because like if I have a rotation in 2D, every vector, even if it's like a small rotation, every vector has to rotate somewhere, right? So there won't be any vector that would actually stay put up to a scale. See that? And there is a way to fix that. So it would be, it would be sad if we could not just find eigenvalues and eigenvectors for uh, these type of matrices. So what we can do is to go for, turn for help to complex numbers. <laughs> it turns out to be actually quite useful. So let's see what, ah, uh -huh, here. Um, Right, so maybe I can show you. So what, what, what is the problem? Like if I take a rotation like this one, so this is a <coughs> rotation by minus 90 degrees, okay? I will go through that uh, more carefully in a little bit. But the point here is that you get a quadratic polynomial with just no real roots, okay? In this case, I got lamb lambda squared plus one, right? So the, the parabola looks like this, right? So. It's actually exactly like this, right? So it's never gonna intersect the x-axis. So no eigenvalues, period. However, what you can do is you can find solutions, you can find roots in the complex domain. So to, to do that, let's first do a quick refresher. I hope you all know complex numbers, but you're gonna do a quick refresher of that anyway. 
because some of the properties you might not remember, like how does the conjugation behave, for example. Everybody knows complex numbers, I hope. So let's look at it quickly. So the point of complex numbers is so we are able to take a square root of minus one, right? So we introduce this imaginary number i, which is sort of cool, which has the property that i squared is minus one. This, there's actually more numbers with, with these properties. Complex numbers is by far the most important case of these funny algebras, but there are others, right? <laughs> you have already heard of quaternions, for example, where I have also j and k, which, also, which has some other funny multiplication rules. And even funnier, even funner, <laughs> are dual numbers, where you put like a special unit, which has the property that its square is zero. So there are all sorts of weird algebras, but they are actually useful. Complex numbers are by far the most useful. <coughs> Some books I read in linear, on linear algebra, they just basically like did everything in complex numbers. Just like real, real, real numbers, just a special case of a complex number. But why is that? Well, because complex number is basically like, like a two-dimensional vector, right? It has two components, x1 and y1, but the second one is multiplied by this, by, by i, by the imaginary unit. And it has the obvious properties you would expect. So if I add the two complex numbers, I just add the components as if it was two-dimensional vectors. Subtraction is also obvious. Multiplication, well, multiplication, this, this formula you can derive, right, quite directly. So if I have x1 plus i y1, and I'm multiplying with x2 plus i y2, then what I do, I just, I just use distributivity. So I get x1, x2. No, what's the best way to write it? I, y1, x2, plus here would be i, x1, y2, and minus y1, y2, right? So if I rearrange it, I get x1, x2, minus y1, y2, that's the real part, plus, sorry about writing it, so x1, y2, minus y, oops, 1, x2. That's the imaginary part, right? All, all, all I need there is distributivity. Now what's also true is uh, commutativity in complex numbers. So I guess I don't have it there. So, but it's nevertheless, it's true. So for every lambda one and lambda two from C, so C is the set of complex numbers, as opposed to R, which was the set of real numbers. It's true that lambda one, lambda two equals lambda two, lambda one. And I guess you, you could directly prove it like this. No, no, no big deal. Uh, I, could, I guess I could also define multiplication by a scalar, right? But by a real scalar, but it's, that's, that's obvious that if I do alpha lambda one, then the result is just alpha x one plus i alpha y one. That's nothing special really. Now the important thing we will need a lot in the following is the conjugation. Conjugation is interesting, we did, not, we did not have that in real numbers. So what does conjugation do? It flips the sign of the imaginary part, okay? So real numbers are a subset of complex numbers. So what, what the conjugation does on real numbers? Because of course, if, if this y1 happens to be zero, then I just have a real number, right? So I can write it like reals are a subset of C. So what does the conjugation do for a real number? That will be important later. Don't be shy. <laughs> Absolutely nothing, right? Because if the y1 is zero, then taking min minus y1, well, it doesn't do anything, okay? Absolute value, that's, that's also important. So absolute value, you can either define it like this, but like, I guess a better uh, way to look at it is like lambda one, lambda one conjugate, okay? Because what happens if I do, let's, let's take a look at it, lambda one, lambda one conjugate, well, what that, what that means, so lambda one is x one plus i y one, and lambda one conjugate is x one, oh, sorry, minus i y one, that's the whole point, right? And if I work out the multiplication, it turns out that these middle guys, y1, x1, and x1, y1 with i, they subtract. And I end up, and y squared is minus one, right? So it cancels with this minus. So this is amazingly exactly the square norm of the corresponding vector. So if you wanna 
that's, that's sometimes useful to think about complex numbers like 2D vectors. And this, the complex number multiplied with its conjugate is the square norm. So if I take the square root of it, I get the, this what's called the norm of the complex number or absolute value. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> if you want to invert a complex number, that's where the absolute value becomes uh, useful. So this is what you do. So if the complex number was a uh, unit, if it was length one, if the absolute value, if the norm was one, then all you need to do is conjugate it. Uh, if it's uh, not norm one, then what you'd have to do is this you uh, take the conjugate and divide by its square norm, right? Why? Well, because if one, after you multiply this with lambda one, then lambda one, lambda one uh, conjugate will give you a lambda one uh, squared, so this will just give you one. So that's what you would want from an inverse, right, to give you back one. That's, by the way, uh, that's, that's the thing that breaks with dual numbers. You, not every dual number has an inverse. But you don't have to worry about that. In complex numbers, everything is cool. <coughs> In particular, the commutativity, this property, you only learn to appreciate when you lose it. When you lose it is in quaternions, for example. So complex numbers are special types of these, I guess, geometric algebras, which uh, actually are commutative. Anyway, what will be most important uh, in the following is the following property of conjugation. So if I take lambda one, lambda, again, I should start, I guess, for every lambda one, lambda two complex, it's true that lambda one, lambda two conjugated is the same as lambda one conjugated times lambda two conjugated. <coughs> okay. Again, you could, you could prove that trivially just by working out the complex multiplication. Um, so I guess here this invisible operation in both cases that's complex number multiplication if you want to sort of give it like the type semantics, okay? And of course, all similarly, if I take lambda one plus lambda two and I conjugate the whole thing, it's the same thing as taking lambda one conjugating and adding lambda two conjugated to it, okay? So this is what we will need later when we'll be talking about complex eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Make sense? Is that, is, that, is that easy? Is that just uh, something you knew all the time? Good. You probably have it fresher in your mind than I do. <laughs> okay, so let's take a look at the polar form. So you probably also know that complex numbers essentially live in the complex plane, which I can write as my favorite 2D plane, right? You basically identify every complex number with 2D vector. And it's nothing special about complex numbers. Every 2D vector I can write in polar, polar coordinates, right? I can write, if I give you any uh, 2D vector, you can always find R and theta such that you can write the vector like this, right? Because cosine theta, sine theta can point to arbitrarily on unit, unit disk, and R can scale it arbitrarily. Ge geometric proof that that's, that's always possible. <laughs> Yeah, and in complex numbers, this is gonna be particularly important. I guess the algebraic proof would be that the R is just the norm of the input uh, complex number, and the theta would be the arc tangents. I sort of prefer, do you know the Aton 2 routine? Have you heard of Aton 2? If you haven't, and if you ever come across this, then remember Aton 2 is the way to save you some trouble <laughs> with worrying about in which quadrant the input vector x is. Aton 2 works uh, regardless of where the input vector is. Like if, if the input vector is here, Aton 2 still gives you the right angle like this, like 320 degrees or something like this. So. If you ever need to compute this, then remember that calling Aton2, I think it's in MATLAB2 and pretty much in all languages, is the, is the easiest way to do it. All right. So now we have the polar form and we can look at Euler's formula for complex numbers. I suppose you also remember that, don't you? It's actually related to what we'll be doing later with matrices. We'll be taking exponentials of a matrix 
it sounds weird, but it's actually not that bad after you uh, wrap your head around eigenvalues. <coughs> so let's start with the complex exponential. So it means to uh, take the e to some power which is a complex number. And there is this formula that, uh, that's the Euler's formula. Uh, how could you prove that? That actually, that's actually fairly easy to prove, right? Because you know that e to z is defined using this power series, or plus z squared plus z cubed. I think you got the pattern by now, and it go keeps going to infinity, right? And it turns out that if for z you plug in i theta, then because the i's raise two powers, they, they, they just drop out and give you minus ones and plus ones, you can actually split this into the Taylor series for sine and cosine. So that's, that's why this is true. Uh, this gives you, this is, this is just like a funny thing. <laughs> if you use their pi, you get this funny formula that e to i pi equals minus one. <laughs> Because of course for pi the cosine is minus one, the sine is zero, so you get this funny formula. But that's just like, a <laughs> I guess, a nerdy thing. <coughs> what is important thing is, uh, since we have the polar form, then we can write every complex number like this, right? So this this was the polar form. So any complex number I can write like this, right? Where r is, I guess I should write that r is real. Theta, of course, is also real. That's the angle. And after I have written in the polar form, I can just use Euler's formula, so I can write it as uh, r uh, e to i theta. Okay. And you can also use the natural logarithm on r. So you can just use the fact that r equals e to the natural logarithm of r, right? So then you will get. Let's let's work it out a little bit slower. R L and then r e to i theta, well then you can just add them together, right? And you will get logarithm of r, natural logarithm of r plus i a theta. So that, that's what's written here. And if you have that, then you can just, uh, oh, uh, this is just a symbol for a complex multiplication. So if you have it in this form, then doing the complex multiplication gets easier because all you need to do is sum the logarithms of the scales of the r's and then sum the angles. Okay. So actually from this you can see an interesting thing. Let's imagine that we are dealing just with unit complex numbers. So unit complex numbers means that their norm is one. So that means that the R is one. Okay, so that the logarithms here, they don't exist because the natural logarithm of one is zero, or any logarithm of one is zero, right? So this, this is not there. So what then happens? What are complex numbers, unit complex numbers? So their multiplication means just adding the angles, right? So that, that means an interesting thing. That means that com um, unit complex numbers essentially represent 2D rotations in the sense that if I multiply the two complex numbers, it's equivalent to composing the rotations, right? Because composed rotations, in, in 2D, all rotations have the same axis, right? That's the, that's the z-axis, the axis perpendicular to my 2D plane. And to compose the rotations, all I need to do is to sum the angles of rotation, right? This, is, this gets much trickier in 3D, because in 3D, you can have arbitrary uh, axis of rotations, right? So there you certainly cannot just sum the angles. That would be completely wrong. But in 2D you can do that. In 2D it's even true that the <coughs> rotations are commutative, right? In 3D that's not the case. But okay, my point was that unit complex numbers represent 2D rotations. That's exactly what quaternions generalize. Quaternions generalize this to 3D. Quaternions represent 3D rotations except that you have to be much more careful because in 3D the rotations are not commutative and you have to worry about where the, where the axis of rotation actually is. That's what quaternions take care of magically. Okay, so that's my quick refresher of complex numbers and we can now use them to find complex eigenvalues because that's 
that's that's I guess our a solution to the problem that we cannot always find a real eigenvalue. So what we are gonna do? We are gonna find complex eigenvalues. So I showed this slide before, but let me go through it again a little bit slower now. So uh, we are almost always interested in matrices with real coefficients, okay? However, of course, it, it can happen, um, as in this case, that the roots will be complex. So. Well, let's let's look. Let's let's start with this example. So this matrix is a rotation, right? It's a rotation. You can easily see if you write down the general rotation formula in our typical right-handed coordinate system. So that's our generic one. So you can see that this is a rotation by minus ninety degrees, right? <coughs> but that doesn't really matter because any any rotation would, would give you a similar result. So if you write down the characteristic polynomials, that means I subtract from the di diagonal lambda and I compute a determinant. So I get lambda squared plus one, do you follow? And lambda squared plus one looks like this, right? The minimum would be at one, but it's never going to intersect the real axis. Nevertheless, everything is cool if I go to uh, complex numbers because the complex solutions are simply plus and minus uh, i, right? Because if I square it, if I square plus minus i, since I'm squaring, it doesn't matter if it's plus or minus, right? In both cases, just I squared, and that's minus one. If I add one, I have zero. So indeed, that's a complex root of my polynomial, okay? And that's always guaranteed to work because there is a thing called um, fundamental theorem of algebra, which is a funny type of thing. Have you heard, have you heard that before? Because this fundamental theorem of algebra is neither fundamental nor of algebra. <laughs> But nevertheless, it's true. And what does it say is that every non-constant polynomial has a complex root, okay? And from that follows that if you have a polynomial of degree n, then it has always n complex roots. So this problem that I would not be able to find roots uh, in the complex domain does not happen. You can always do that. This theorem actually uses calculus. It, 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 it requires some complex analysis. So don't ask me right now how, how to prove that because I wouldn't remember off the top of my head. So that, that's not, an, not a theorem of algebra. And it, it's also nothing really fundamental in from the viewpoint of modern algebra. I think it's like, his, it's, it's called fundamental historically when algebra meant like solving like systems of like equations, like polynomial equations. So back, back in the day, maybe it was fundamental. Nevertheless, it's useful here because it assur assures us that the characteristic polynomial is always going to have uh, n solutions where n is the degree of the polynomial or n is the size of the matrix. In the case, it's a characteristic polynomial. Of course, the fundamental theorem of linear algebra applies also to, uh, to all polynomials, not just to characteristic polynomials. Okay. Yeah, so here we found that the uh, eigenvalues are plus or minus i. And actually this, uh, you can notice that they are conjugate pairs, right? Because conjugate, conjugate of i is minus i, right? And you can actually think about it and you can realize that this is always true. So uh, what is always true? If uh, lambda is a complex eigenvalue, then lambda conjugate is also going to be an eigenvalue. So the, eigen, the complex eigenvalues come in pairs. This is quite important to realize. So let me, uh, let me elaborate on that. Why, why is that, right? So if I, have, if I have a polynomial, it's a complex polynomial now with, with real coefficients, the A, B, and C, they came from a real matrix, right? So A, B, and C are real numbers. Let me write it here to make these super clear. And now what is P of lambda conjugate? So now we're gonna apply the rules I mentioned uh, in the beginning. So uh, 
well, let's just write it slowly, right? So I just plug in the conjugate lambda here. And what I know is that um, lambda conjugate times lambda conjugate equals lambda times lambda, the whole thing conjugated, right? So lambda squared conjugated, okay? The other thing, well, uh, I will just copy this. Let's make it, let's do it slowly. Now, ABC are real numbers, okay? So if I conjugate those, nothing happens, right? So A conjugate equals A, B conjugate equals B, and so on. And so I guess CC conjugate equals C, because they are real numbers. They have zero imaginary parts, so I can be conjugated all I want. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna change anything. So this is equal to <coughs> A conjugated, lambda square conjugated, plus B conjugated, lambda conjugated, C conjugated. So again, I can apply the product rule, right? So, uh, and then I can apply the rule that it doesn't matter if I first conjugate and then sum or first sum and then conjugate. So it turns out that I can basically conjugate everything, A lambda squared plus B lambda plus C, the whole thing conjugated. Uh, but that's nothing but my original polynomial conjugated, right? P lambda, the whole thing conjugated, right? So obviously if P lambda was zero, well then certainly P lambda conjugated is going to be zero, right? Because zero conjugated is still zero, right? Zero is a real number. And, and the other way around, right? <coughs> if P lambda conjugated was zero, then the P, uh, P lambda must be zero as well. So that means, what this means is that if lambda is an eigenvalue, complex eigenvalue or real eigenvalue too but in for real eigenvalue this doesn't this doesn't this does not say anything because lambda conjugated for lambda real would be just lambda <coughs> for the, where it's interesting is for a complex eigenvalue and says that if a lambda is an eigenvalue that lambda conjugated is also an eigenvalue so the complex eigenvalues are come in pairs conjugated pairs okay now why, here, is, here is why uh, it's important, or here is one thing that immediately follows uh, from that. Remember the case of the 3D rotation. What did we say about 3D rotation and eigenvectors, eigenvalues of a 3D rotation, just from the geometric intuition? So your geometric intuition is the scaling one, right? So. This is the geometric intuition of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So what does that tell you for 3D rotations? What is the eigenvector and corresponding eigenvalue of a 3D rotation? Yeah. The, axis. the axis of rotation is the eigenvector and the eigenvalue is how much? <laughs> if it's a rotation, then it cannot change lengths, right? So if I have a vector, I'm rotated somewhere else, the length of the vector does not change, right? So what does it mean for the eigenvalue? It must be one, because if it wasn't one, it would change the length, but it can't do that, right? So yeah, so we know this from the geometric intuition, but here using, using this fact, using I guess this fact, we can show it algebraically, because if I'm in 3D, I have a three by three matrix, <coughs> then I'll get a characteristic poly polynomial of degree three, okay? And it means it will have three complex eigenvalues, okay? And uh, the complex ones, they have to come in pairs. If lambda is a complex eigenvalue, lambda conjugate must also be a complex eigenvalue. So there is only a third one left, and that must be, that must be a real, right? Because if it wasn't real, it would actually have to have four eigenvalues, but that's impossible because it's only a polynomial of degree three. So that's, that's an algebraic argument why rotation has an axis, <laughs> which is sort of cool. You can again see like the, the relationship between algebra and geometry, it's, it's, it's there. Okay, so we are not quite done here yet because so far we have only found the eigenvalues, okay? So they are now complex eigenvalues, you don't have to freak out because everything, everything still works, right? That's what I was sort of always alluding to when I was talking about vector spaces and so on that they work um, with arbitrary fields. So you can just have vector spaces and matrices and everything over complex numbers as opposed to reals. And that's exactly what we need to use here. <coughs>
we are not gonna do it too much so you will end up having matrices with complex values and the scalar multiplication means multiplying by a complex number but it's all cool because you can just compute with complex numbers right the only thing is if you are actually implementing it's a little bit annoying because you need like a complex numbers library because every complex number actually has two parts so computationally it's a little bit more funny but mathematically it's not that much more difficult Right, so this, this, this is what I elaborated on here. Okay. So how do we find the corresponding eigenvectors? Let's, let's, let's keep working on this example. So I still have this matrix, which is a minus 90 degrees rotation. Uh, let me try to find its eigenvectors, okay? So clearly the matrix now, after I subtract the eigenvalues, so the same, re I'm following the same recipe as before. Okay, let me go slower. <laughs> I think I had too much coffee or something. <laughs> or I don't know, is it, is it too slow or too fast for you? Or, <laughs> or is it okay? <laughs> I think it is a yes. <laughs> so, so I found, so far I found the eigenvalues and now I need to find the corresponding eigenvectors. So I follow the same recipe as before. So I subtract the given eigenvalues from the matrix and I'm looking for a vector in the null space of the matrix, okay? I guess a little bit funny because after I subtract the eigenvalues, so let me start with the first one, just i. The second one is gonna be i minus i, right, conjugated. So after I subtract it, I get a complex matrix, okay? So what I need to do is uh, find, uh, of course, it's gonna be a complex vector in the null space of this matrix, okay? So it gets a little bit more funny, but uh, basically the same uh, ideas as we discussed before, they, they are equally valid. You can do Gaussian elimination on complex matrices. Everything works, except that your scalar multiplication is multiplication by a complex number. Now, I, I don't think I will really need you to, to, to do that, so you don't have to worry about it too much. Here we can just like, uh, quite easily see that the vector in the null space will be for, for example, this, minus i1. So let's try that. So if I do minus i, so here I will get the minuses cancel and y i squared is minus one, so this is zero, that's cool. And here I get i minus i, so that's also zero. So indeed, that's, that's correct. And again, here I could multiply it by an arbitrary complex number, non-zero complex number, I would still get a valid eigenvector, okay? So this is my eigenvector corresponding to eigenvalue i. It's a complex vector, but that's, that's what we have to do here. <laughs> I guess why it's not such a big deal is because later uh, we will uh, figure out a ways to get around the complex eigenvectors. So I guess the one way you can look at complex numbers, because it's sort of weird, right? I'm not entirely sure what would be the geometric interpretation of this. Maybe somebody has that, but I, I, don't, I don't see that, uh, at least not right now. Uh, so one way you can look at the complex numbers is as a tool that will ultimately get us something uh, real so eventually, something that we can uh, more easily reason about. If we do it for the second eigenvalue uh, for uh, lambda, I guess lambda two equals minus i, then if we, if we repeat the process, right? So now I would have, have the plus i, again plus i, and I would find a vector in the null space of the matrix. And what I would find out is that this vector is i and one. And you can notice a funny thing about these two vectors. Do you, know, do you notice some, something about them? They are somehow related, right? Yes, they are, they are conjugates of each other, right? So I, of course I can be conjugated an entire vector, right? So if I have a vector with components, well, I guess that's, that's trivial, right? So if I conjugate the vector, that means I just, it's a complex vector, so C to N. So that means I conjugate every single component of it. Easy, right? And indeed, if I conjugate this, minus I becomes I, and one was a real number, so it just stays one, okay? And again, that's not a coincidence, right? What I said before is that the complex eigenvalues come in complex conjugate pairs. And the same thing is true for the eigenvectors, okay? So let's take a look at it, why? It's a fairly uh, simple argument. It's again because our matrix has real entries, okay? 
So if I have, um, this, is, this is the formula defining eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And what I can do now is, see that? And if I plug in, you know what, let me get rid of the arrows because the arrows sort of get confused with the conjugation. So let's digit the arrows. And let me plug in the conjugated vector with the conjugated eigenvalue. So we already know that lambda conjugate is an eigenvalue, right? And here I would like to, um, wait, that's not what I wanted. Here, this is what I want to prove. I want to prove that a v conjugate will be lambda conjugate v conjugate, okay? <clears throat> Where the v conjugate means this vector conjugation. Well, the first thing is that I can conjugate entire A, all elements in A, because they are real numbers, so A trivial equals its conjugation. And again, because matrix vector multiplication is just a sequence, it's just a linear combination, sequence of all ordinary multiplications, then I can write this like this. I can do the vector matrix product and then conjugate the whole thing. It's going to be exactly the same, right? That's sort of similar to what we were doing here. And you can take the conjugation above all multiplications and additions. Okay, trust me. Well then, but then AV, we already know that's lambda V, right? Because V was an eigenvalue, uh, sorry, V was an eigenvector of A with eigenvalue lambda, right? So what I can do from this, this equation, I can just write here lambda V conjugated, right? And we're just like one step away from lambda conjugate V conjugate, right? And we know that lambda conjugate is an eigenvalue. And from this, you can easily, uh, almost trivially see that V conjugate is going to be the corresponding eigenvector. It's nice, right? I, I think I, I, I like that. It sort of gives it some, some more reason to these complex things. <laughs> At least they are not like completely random or <laughs> arbitrary. Got it? Okay, so um, the next thing we are gonna look at is a diagonalization. Guess let's start with like before we go there let's start with um, motivation like one thing that eigenvalues eigenvectors could be useful for would be to I guess optimize matrix vector products okay so because if you already know if somebody tells you that V is an eigenvector of matrix this allows you to optimize matrix vector products tremendously right like think about it from the computational viewpoint like think that uh, you need to compute a to the power of k, so that means, of course, a times a times a and so on, k times applied to v, okay? Well, if you already know that v is an eigenvector and you know its corresponding eigenvalue, then it would be really dumb to be just doing this multiplication one matrix at a time, right? Because each, each of them would require you to multiply a vector with a matrix, right? That's how many operations is that if the matrix is n by n? n squared, exactly. And that's for one multiplication. So here, here I would have to make k of them, so the complexity would be k n squared. For large k, if the k is like a million, that, that could be a lot, right? And for large n too, right? But if it's, if it's an eigen, and we will, we will have an example in a little bit that will actually be going exactly in this direction. You can then, you can even take the k going to infinity and then you can, uh, then you will really see the power of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So here, this is like a motivational example is that you can replace all this uh, complex compute by simply raising to the power of k the eigenvalue. So how much compute is that? <laughs> one right <laughs> just like calling like the power function right and then multiplied with v what would be complexity of that if v is an n-dimensional vector o n right huge savings right mm -hmm. i guess that's just like a sort of silly motivation now the diagonalization that basically leads to eigenvalue decomposition which is a quite important type of decomposition is essentially a step away from single value decomposition, which is going to be, which I keep advertising as the holy grail of linear algebra. 
Uh, so eigenvalue decomposition is essentially the, the cornerstone of it. So let's, uh, let's look at it in a special case where, it, where things get a little bit easier. Later I will generalize it and things get more difficult. But let's assume first that the matrix has unique eigenvalues. That means that every eigenvalue is different, okay? And let's make it even simpler. Well, yeah, let's let's you know, let's not worry for now about the complex one. I think the same thing, the, the stuff would work e equally well in complex one. But let's just simply assume that all the eigenvalues and eigenvectors are real in this case. In the example I have later, that that that's going to be the case anyway. Okay, what is important here is to realize that if you have unique eigenvalues, then its corresponding eigenvectors are linearly independent. Okay, so what do I mean by unique eigenvalues? Well, if you get a characteristic polynomial that looks something like this, to a power of 100 or whatever, then the fundamental theorem of algebra guarantees you that you will have 100 roots, right? But the problem is that all the roots, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, they are all the same. Right? They are all ones. Right? That's, that, that's what the roots are. So that's the case when you don't get unique eigenvalues. They are all the same. <coughs> that's sort of a special case which, which introduces some problems. Uh, if that's not the case, if all the eigenvalues are unique, then we can prove that the I corresponding eigenvectors will be linearly independent very important thing if your matrix is data then almost always you are guaranteed almost guaranteed that they will be unique because if there is like some noise and so on it's it will be very unlikely unless there are some special circumstances that they would be the they, they would be not unique <coughs> well we can leave that discussion for later when we talk about page rank and so on so let's look now why is this true so the matrix has unique eigenvalues why the eigenvectors would be linearly independent. So let me, um, let's let me work it out on a piece of paper. It's not completely trivial. At least I don't think it's completely trivial. <coughs> so if I have a matrix, which is n by n, and I have eigenvectors, so let's say I have some number of eigenvectors, doesn't really matter, X, let's say I have J of them. You know what, I will not, I will not bother with these arrows, there will be too much writing. Our <coughs> eigenvectors. And with corresponding eigenvalues, lambda one to lambda J. And I assume such that they are different. So lambda i is different from lambda k for any i not equal k, okay? And the, I guess the theorem says that this implies under these conditions, I can conclude that x1 to xj are all linearly independent. Okay, so that's, that's like a statement, like a theorem, if you will. So how do we prove that? Well, let's, let's first look at the case of J being two, okay? So what does it say if, if we have just two eigenvectors with different eigenvalues? So we have, so first of all, what does it mean to be linearly independent? Let's, let's elaborate on that. So X1 and X2 are linearly independent if and only if the C1 uh, X1 plus C2 X2 equals zero implies that C1 and C2 are both zero. Okay, remember that? This is our definition of linear independence. If the only combination of the two vectors that gives a zero vector is the trivial one, okay? Of course, like you need to put like the brackets, right? Right, this is like the equivalence here. <laughs> and this, this is the condition of linear independence. So what does it mean? So that means that I need to, so 
what I assume is that I have two eigenvectors with different eigenvalues. And I assume that I take some linear combination of them with coefficient C1 and C2, okay? And from this, I need to prove that the C1 and C2 will be zero. So how am I gonna do that? Well, okay, so I'll start from this. I will start from C1 x1 plus C2 x2 equals zero, okay? And I'm gonna multiply the whole thing by A. So let's do that. So I'll, I'll do C1 A x1 plus C2 A x2. By the way, the C1 and C2, of course, are scalar, right? Let me just put it here to make it very clear. So multiply by a, this of course remains zero, right? Because a times zero remains zero. And now I use the fact that x1 and x2 are eigenvectors, okay? So what that means is that this gives me c1 lambda one x1, and this gives me c2 lambda two x2 is zero, okay? Now on the other hand, what I can do, I can take this equation and multiply it by lambda one, right? If I do that, I will get this. I will get C1 lambda 1 x1. And I'll get C2 uh, lambda 1 x2. Okay, so I just took this vector equation, multiply by lambda. I can do that, right? Nobody can stop me from doing that. And now I have these two equations, so I can subtract them. You can see that the first term is going to fall out because it's the same, both of them. And the second one is going to be what? It's going to be C2 lambda 1 minus lambda 2 x2 equals 0. Okay, now, now, now that's interesting. Because why it's interesting? Because x2 is an eigenvector, right? So it can be 0. We, did, we dis disallow that for a reason. And lambda is different from lambda 2. I have this assumption that they are all different, right? So this is also, this is a scalar which is non-zero. So what that means is, well, that I have no other possibility to conclude than to conclude that C2 must be zero, right? If this whole thing is zero, these guys are not, then C2 must be, okay? So that's cool, that's what I needed. And I also need uh, that C1 is zero, okay? How do I do that? Well, in a similar way, right? I can multiply this formula by lambda two. I will get C1 lambda two x1 plus C2 lambda two x2 equals zero. <coughs> I subtract it from this one, from the, from the same formula as before. I'll get C1 lambda 2 minus lambda 1 x1 equals 0 because now these two guys subtract. Okay. And again, same, same argument as before. Non-zero, non-zero implies that C1 must be 0. So indeed, in the 2D case, I've just shown that. In the general case, it's a little bit more writing. I'm debating if I actually want to. Well, let's 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 do that. Let's see, let's see if I can do that quickly. So this was the k equals two case. So in the general case, what I need to do? Did you did you, did you get this by the way? Because otherwise it wouldn't make sense to make the general general j. <laughs> so if I really have the general statement like this, so then I need to prove that c1 x1 plus plus cj xj equals zero. And from this, I need to prove, this is what I need to prove, is that all the c's will be zeros. It gets a little bit more, I mean, the, the idea is exactly the same. Let me just show you, let me just show you that the same idea works. You just need to apply it more times. So I, again, multiply this by a. So all the terms there <coughs> multiply by a. So here is cj axj equals zero. Well, those are all eigenvectors, right? So this is Cj, uh, sorry, C1 lambda one x1, because they are eigenvectors, C2 uh, lambda two x2, and so on, up to Cj lambda j x j equals zero, okay? Now I can take this, multiply by lambda one, that's the same sort of idea I was doing before, right? So lambda one x1, here was C2, and now it's going to be lambda 1 x2 plus Cj lambda 1 xj equals 0. And guess what? I'm going to subtract them, right? So after I subtract them, the first term falls out. And what I'm going to be left with is C2 
lambda 1 minus lambda 2 x2 and all of them will be like this uh, including the last one so lambda 1 minus lambda j xj equals 0 Okay, what I'm gonna do now, I'm essentially gonna iterate the same process, right? So I'm gonna take this, multiply it by A again. It gets like a little bit. You know what, let me do it quicker. So if I multiply it by A, here, here I will get lambda 2x2 because it's an eigenvector. And here I will get lambda j. If I multiply it by A, right? But I can also take this and multiply it with lambda 2, right? So that gives me this. Lambda 2x2 plus... Da -da -da. I guess this is one of these like technical proofs which I was mostly skipping. But uh, this is an important property, so I just wanted to give you some a better justification for it than just trust me. So if I subtract this, then these, these two guys cancel out. And so on. I could I could keep doing this process so now now this one would cancel out and if I just keep repeating this eventually I will end up with this cj lambda 1 minus lambda j lambda 2 minus lambda j and so on up to lambda j minus 1 minus lambda j xj equals 0 and here are the same argument this is a non-zero vector and all of them were different all of them must be non-zeros, right? The only guy that must be zero there is CJ. So that implies that CJ has to be absolutely zero. And once you have figured out it for CJ, then you can just uh, knock it out, right? Because you already know that CJ is zero and repeat the same process on the remaining coefficients. Ultimately, you'll get that CJ minus one is zero and you knock off CJ minus one and ultimately you work your way down back to showing that CJ, CC one is also zero. Okay, this is a proof. Maybe there is like a simple, I, I would bet there is probably some simple proof, but this is sort of, this is, it's simple in terms of ideas. It's like a little bit annoying in terms of writing because like a lot of writing. So there's probably a little more elegant proof of that, I would guess. Okay. So why I was doing all this? I was doing all this so then we can talk about diagonalization, right? So let's go back to this slide. So what I was basically showing here is that if I have unique eigenvalues, they and then the eigenvectors are linearly independent. Okay. Well, if I have n eigenvectors and eigenvalues, so if I make matrix plus n by n, if I have n linearly independent vectors, that means that they are a basis, right? And you should remember now that basis is a good, did I, did I lose you in the proof? If you can then wake up because the rest of it will not really need the proof, we'll just use it. Basis is a good thing, right? Because any vector from our vector space Rn can be written as a linear combination of the vector basis with the basis vector sorry i guess i didn't lose you i guess you're just getting tired <laughs> and so am i <coughs> just this point in the lecture but let's 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 try to um follow this so i take arbitrary vector and can i can write it as a linear combination of the basis vectors okay so what does it mean uh, it means that if i then apply the transformation a to the vector I can use the fact that the, these are eigenvectors, right? So the transformation essentially reduces to scaling of the basis vector, of the eigenvectors, okay? And that's true even if I repeatedly um, apply matrix A, okay? If I apply it second time, if I just, if I just did this, right, A, A, X, then I just apply A to this, what does it do? Well, it, it, it gives me, it sprouts more eigenvalues, so I raise them to power, power 2, and in general, if I apply k to power of A, then just means that I just raise all the eigenvalues to the power of k. So that's exactly generalizing this idea for a single eigenvector, but the significance of this is that it applies to absolutely arbitrary vector, 
So what we can what we can then do is basically get eigenvalue decomposition or let's let's go through it um, in terms of sums first. So this is basically what I was saying. So we are assuming we have unique eigenvalues and eigenvectors are linearly independent y using the theorem I just uh, proved, I guess. So we have a basis, we can write it like this. And if we write this in matrix form, so let me put all these vectors Vs, all the eigenvectors into a matrix, okay? So the V will be an N by N matrix. I guess let's just assume real, let's not complicate with complex numbers now. And this, this sum is the linear combination of all the vectors can be written as matrix vector product, okay? So I just stack all the eigenvectors into matrix V. No big deal. But what is a big deal is that since the eigenvectors are linearly independent, that means that the matrix is invertible. Okay. Well, that means that I can take the inverse of it. And that's quite interesting. That, that gives you gives me a quick formula how to find these coefficients if I'm giving an X, right? That, that's exactly what V inverse means. And that ultimately leads me to, again, value decomposition, or a way to diagonalize a matrix. So how could we, um, maybe it's better to break this into pieces. So what means the V, V inverse X was the thing that, that, that that's, that's from here, right? V inverse X is the vector of Y's, right? So lambda the inverse of x is a vector that looks like this. It has y1 lambda 1 up to yn lambda n, right? Because y, if, if y is a vector with coefficients y1 to yn, then the lambda, uh, I guess I should probably explain what the lambda is. The lambda is a diagonal matrix which has the eigenvalues on its diagonal, okay? So in that, in, wh what that means is that it scales every uh, element of the inverse x, that's the y vector, by the lambdas, okay? And if I just put there back the v, so if I, if I do this, uh, ultimately, so if I do v, lambda v inverse x and we are simply back to uh, the formula i had here before this one it's the best way to show this so this is y1 lambda 1 right and if the v basically just means take a linear combination of all the v vectors so we are back to this formula y1 lambda 1 v1 plus y n lambda n v n Okay, which is nothing but AX. So indeed, AX can be written if we have all the eigenvectors and eigenvalues like this. And because this is true for arbitrary X, that means that the two matrices must be equal, right? I can just plug in standard basis vectors and that gives me that all, all the columns of, of both the matrices must be the same. By the way, if you just uh, multiply this, this formula from the right with V, you get that AV equals V lambda. And that's basically just a different way uh, to write the defining property of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Because if you, if you just write it out like this, so the, the vector, the columns of V are the vectors V1 to Vn. So if I have here my V1 to Vn, and the matrix lambda is like this. Let me put it here too. So this is the diagonal matrix with eigenvalues on the diagonal. So from here, you can simply read that A V I equals lambda I V I. So that's basically just a matrix version of the defining property. So this is, this is, this is nothing special. It's how we define eigenvalues and eigenvectors to begin with. But what is special is that in this case, the matrix V is invertible. So I can flip it, I can 
I can multiply by the inverse, so I release the V from here and instead it goes on the other side. Sometimes this is called that the matrix A is similar to a diagonal matrix. Okay, so I have an, is that clear? Okay, so next I have an example. So we look at some actual application because we are supposed to be doing applications here. Let's see if I can finish this today. If not, I will just finish it tomorrow. So this example is sort of cool. It's about a stoch stochastic process. And the specific process we'll be looking in is the distribution of rental cars in the country, okay? So for some reason we are interested in the population of rental cars in Denver. And I can say that the initial distribution is like this, like 0 0.02 and 0 0.98. That means that I have some population of rental cars in the entire country. And 2% of them are inside Denver, in Denver. And 98% are outside, somewhere else, okay? That's like you just take a given moment in time and you just like look at the uh, entire population of rental cars. Just look how many, what percentage of them is in Denver, what percentage is outside. And let's assume that we hired some statisticians or somebody who like crunched some numbers and came up with this model. So came up with this model. Every month what happens, there's going to be some traffic, right? And 80 cars that are in Denver stay in Denver okay 20% of them leave right so of course this has to sum to 100% because if we have correctly accounted for all cars right so that means that most of the cars that were there stay there that, that's sort of plausible right and just a small fraction of them goes go somewhere somewhere outside and on the other on the other hand, five percent come in from the outside. Come in, meaning from the outside back to Denver, and ninety-five percent of the cars that were already outside stay outside. Okay, so this 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 first means basically the ones that are in Denver, what's gonna happen to them, and the other uh, is the second line tells us what is happening with the cars outside. Okay, <clears throat> and what we are interested in is what is going to happen after long enough time. If I just if if, if this model is true, it doesn't change in time, and I just keep I just let the stochastic system evolve. What is going to be after long enough time? What's going to be the distribution of cars in Denver? Okay, this was the initial one, but every month it's gonna change, right? And I'm interested in what's going to be the, the steady state, the state where the, where the system basically settles. So you can model it with a thing called Markov chain. I don't know if you had Markov chain. This is like a very simple example of that, just, just to sort of illustrate the utility of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So I can illustrate or draw the Markov chain as a graph. So the in means inside Denver, out means outside Denver. So the first, uh, I guess, rule says, or transition says that 80% of them stay and 20% go outside, okay? The skin note says that 90% of the cars that were outside stay outside, so it's transition probability 95. And with probability at 0.5, we go from outside to Denver, okay? I guess the other way you could look at it is like you have like a large population of ants or, or some little um, creatures and they toss a coin or like draw a random number between 0 and 1 and depending on it they decide if they stay or if they go in, in both, both states, okay? Now the, the point is that we can represent this Markov chain using a matrix in this case, it's a particularly simple matrix. So the matrix looks like this. So I put these probabilities. So this is the Denver one, and this is the outside one. 
Notice that the, the values in all the columns sum to one. That's again just reflecting the fact that we are correctly accounting for all cars. This matrix is called a Markov matrix, which means that the matrix has non-negative entries and the elements in all columns sum to one. Because if I do 0 0.8 plus 0 0.2, I get one. And 0 0.05 plus 0.95, that gives me one as well, okay? The one, um, like a convenient way I can write this is if I take like a vector one, multiply with A, I get a vector one back. Or in this case, the vector one just means a vector of two ones. Wait, not, not transposed, right? So if I transpose it and I hit, hit it with the matrix, that just means I'm just summing the two rows of the matrix. And that needs to give me one. It's like a par partition of unity, that's how it's sometimes called. Okay, so uh, what's the significance of this matrix? Well, the, this matrix actually tells me what's going to happen after a single transition, okay? Well, let, let's take a look at it. So if I do, so th this is my initial distribution. So let's call it U0, like my initial distribution. So if I do A times U0, that means I'm doing this. I'm doing 0 0.8, 0 0.5, 0 0.2, 0 0.95, 0.2.9 so this is my initial distribution so what does it do well this is the number of cars that were in Denver and this is the proportion of them which stay in Denver okay and now 98 uh, 0.98 that was the proportion of cars that were outside and 0.05 is the number of cars that came into Denver from outside okay so the first number I computed it before I we don't have to do the math now so after one month after one cycle, after one run of this Markov chain, turns out that 0.065% cars will be in Denver. Okay, so that it, it increased. More entered than left. Okay. And the second row, it, it, it's, it's similar. That's, that accounts for the car that were outside. So point, point 0.02 is the number of cars that were, out, uh, were in Denver. And with probability 0.2, they go outside, okay? So this is the fraction of the cars that went out. And I also have to account for the ones that were already outside and stayed outside, right? So that's going to be the number of the proportion of the cars, or, or you can look at it as probability of, of, of being outside. So in this case, it would be 9, 3, 5. I computed that before, okay? So that's after one, one cycle. Okay. You can notice that this still sums to 1, right? 0 0.065 plus 0 0.935 still sums to 1. And that's actually true in general. It's not so difficult to see. If you do if you do this, so this is my vector 1. So the matrix has this property, right? So if I do one transpose a u zero well because the matrix has this property this is one transpose u zero right but the initial u zero was a distribution so this is just one uh what is i gonna say oh yeah but also a u zero is u one so this this is my news this is my evolve state this is my state after distribution after month one okay so this this basically tells me that one t u one is also one so this 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 implies immediately from like the basic algebra that this is also <coughs> a distribution that it sums to one where no no cars disappeared like they didn't go out of the country or didn't like blow up or something so it's like a good model and my question is, what is the steady state? Okay, so if I keep repeating this, so then after month two, I will get a u1, right? Which is just a squared u0. That's gonna be something else, right? And what I'm interested in what's gonna happen in the long run. In the long run means a to k u0, right? And I'm particularly interested what happens here if k goes to infinity, okay? And you can sort of see there, this, this, this is um, similar to what I was showing before. This is exactly going to eigenvalues and eigenvectors. 
but I think I will have to leave this for the next time to finish this properly. So I'll just leave you with an overhang if that's okay. <laughs> if you want, you can think about it in the meantime. <laughs> What's going to be the steady state distribution and how you could compute it? A hint, you already know everything you need <laughs> to figure that out. Okay, I think I'm gonna release some homework on eigenvectors, eigenvalues tomorrow. So keep, stay tuned. Do you have any questions on this? I will, I will finish this example on Wednesday. Just if we, it's, it's a cool example, so let's go through it properly than rushing it today, okay? All right, thank you. Thank you.